When the phrase Islam in America is mentioned, many may begin to picture recently arriving immigrants, immigrant students, or have recollections of black nationalist Islamic groups such as the Nation of Islam. While all of these elements indeed are part of Islam's growth in America, history seldom visits the struggles of indigenous Muslims dating back to the early 20th century, who in many ways laid the foundation for Muslim communities in America, both immigrant and indigenous. You know, to really talk about how Islam came to Pittsburgh, you have to go way back, um, even before the, uh, the enslavement of, of my ancestors. Um, there is some excellent resources. Um, Van Sertema talks about the, the presence of Muslims in the Americas way before Columbus came. There's evidence of, of our being here. There's a great possibility that uh, uh, West Africans traveled here um, even before the slave trade um, and interacted with the natives of this land um, and uh, were Muslims interacting with the natives of this land. There's, in, there's research in that area so even before 1619 and maybe there's research with that as well. And then you, you go up, you look at um, the, the, the time of the, uh, the slave trade. We know where, where those people came from, we know the areas that they came from, and we have real good evidence to show that many of them were Muslims. They came from a lot of different countries, uh, what is known as Ghana now, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Gambia, um, Nigeria, Africans coming from Mali, you know, and coming over, over to these shores. Um, the percentage, um, some say like 15%, uh, you know, 10 to 15%. Um, maybe uh, somewhere up to 20, but we're st this is a number that's still growing as we speak, as, as this, is, as this uh, documentary is being done, that there's still research that needs to be done because you have Muslim, uh, not only in, um, in the southern states, uh, Muslim graves, we have graves in Trinidad and Jamaica and South America, um, uh, 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 even as far as Puerto Rico, when we start talking about uh, the Spanish influence and, and, and that whole connection and, and what is known as the black Puerto Ricans, you know? And the one thing you gotta realize about this is that no one, you know, no one washed their bodies properly when they died. No one p pointed them to, to Mecca like they should in the grave, you know? Uh, and this is a grave, grave uh, crime that was done, you know? And the fact that we don't know more, you know, and we need to find out more of these people, you know, more of these men and women who were, who were Muslim, who, who were, who were forgotten. And then after the, uh, the Civil War, we know that Muslims uh, migrated and they, they you know, even um, to the point that uh, you, they may not have been, you know, say, saying their prayers five times a day or they, they were things that they had lost because of the enslavement period, but that, um, that in a, that feeling for Islam the um, the dress these these were part and parcel of Islam that we have had with us and so it didn't take much to uh, to water those feelings and to, and to have us bloom so you know we are re-emerging because the religion had been suppressed for so long there were so many parts of it that no one really had all of the pieces this group had this part this you know but in time Islam rose to the to to the surface, but uh, you know the, it was almost um, almost like a cleansing that the Muslims went through to get to where um, to where they they were comfortable and were practicing Islam. There's a brother by the name of Saati Masjid, right? He's known to be to be a follower of Marcus Garvey um, in the twenties, uh, uh, teens and twenties. And he is, we're trying to find out more about him right now. We found letters um, of him and his followers from, from Wilkinsburg uh, of, of this area. Why am I bringing up his name? Because he was from the Sudan. And he actually went to Al Azhar when he found that, no, that, there was more science, that there was a more science temple here. He went to Al Azhar to get a fatwa to come back to deal with Noah Ali and a more science temple. He got the fatwa, but he didn't let him back into the country. He was a, a, a traditional Muslim. Um, and he, again, he was a follower of the, of the UNIA, and he actually set up an organization here, a chapter of the UNIA. You know, people migrated here for one reason, primarily, and that was for work. And once they got here, 
they um, surrounded themselves and associated with people who had like values and, and, and many times those values were Islamic. Sometimes it came through even students from the Arab world. When I say students, sometimes a student would come and he'd speak, stand up, then you get to talking with him. It was through many ways, it was through merchants, people who come here who were merchants, Arab merchants, and uh, then many came from Pakistan, they came here and when they got to talking, you became involved with them. And so it didn't come through one, it wasn't only one way, it came through many people brought it, carried it with them, you know, when they came. And you also have um, a strong connection between Pittsburgh and Cleveland, right? It was almost like a confederation between Pittsburgh and Cleveland. So uh, the Masjid originated here in 1932, and then you have the Masjid in Cleveland it originated in, 1930, in 1934. So there's like, there's like some, some cross, you know, things going on between Pittsburgh and Cleveland as well, and they kind of helped each other out. Brothers uh, Ilian Dean and um, the brother from uh, Cleveland, um, whose name eludes me at this minute, but uh, these were brothers who did kind of missionary work for Islam around between Ohio and Pittsburgh and even sometimes in Newark. Post-slavery, Pittsburgh is the first Sunni masjid that was established in Braddock in 1932. And then two years later, it's Cleveland. So, I mean, you know, Pittsburgh and Cleveland have a very, there's very rich history here that's unique to any other city in the United States. Just for the simple fact that post-slavery, these two masjids was established in 1932 and 1934 as Sunni uh, traditional Islam uh, masjids. It was the first masjid that was incorporated in the United States even before the State Street Masjid. They say that the State Street Masjid was the oldest masjid. State Street Masjid in New York is the oldest masjid in the United States, but Pittsburgh was before the State Street Masjid. The establishment of First Muslim was very closely tied in time to the establishment of the first Muslim mosque in Cleveland. These two brothers um, worked together and uh, one helped to establish Islam in Cleveland and the other was helping to establish uh, Islam here in Pittsburgh. That was in the 30s and 40s when they established, yeah, I remember they established the masjid in Braddock and then in the 50s they moved uh, late 50s, early 60s, they moved to the hill, which is Masjid Owl, first Muslim Masjid, where it's Masjid Owl right now. Um, and when they moved to the hill, they used to walk to Juma, right? So there's stories of them walking from Braddock, some, 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 some brothers and sisters who were left behind in Braddock, walking from Braddock <laughs> to, the, to the hill for Juma, and that's like an hour and a half walk, two hour walk. I think what, what got them through and from what I hear, it was a close-knit type of community. It was a community that was very strong values on family. Uh, it, was a, it was a community that, that definitely like, um, really like uh, insulated itself. You know what I mean? Where it insulated itself from the outside forces. And they went to battle with Moore Science Temple. And they went to battle with, uh, later on, the Nation of Islam. You know what I mean? So when I mean battle, they would have like, Dawah sessions or they would have the, uh, debates. There was a time when it became a little turbulent when people were trying to um, uh, take positions like either you're going to be a uh, Muslim, Sunni Muslim, or you're going to, you know, uh, be a more American. And there was a time when there was some conflict. But from that conflict, uh, the Moors definitely established themselves in another part of town and the, um, the Muslims, the uh, Sunni Muslims also established themselves. Now, so this kind of fortified them, you know. You have a situation where you're having debates um, with the Moor Science Temple and later on the Nation of Islam, you know, you know what I mean? So they kind of went out and targeted these groups and there was, there was conflict. Uh, first Muslims, uh, distinction if, there, if we could use that word, is because it was indigenous Muslims and they were not, um, you know, there's, when you look at history, you, there were other groups that laid some claim to Islam. Uh, but 
the, uh, the Muslims at first Muslim laid claim to the Sunnah of Rasulullah and the pillars of the faith as accepted by the Islamic world. It was uh, to adapt something for Sunni Muslims because really there was no other place that you can say that they were Sunni Muslims. Only you could say that at the first Muslim mosque. Anywhere else you went, or organizations or Moorside or temples or what, but they wanted to establish something for Sunni Muslims. The first Muslim mosque became something of establishment that is teaching the best they could to teaching true Islam. I think that um, the, the early Muslims wanted they wanted to uh, put their stamp on Islam. They wanted to be recognized as uh, part and parcel of this, this place. They wanted, um, you know, the government to recognize them as, as Muslims. And I think that, that was, at first it was just, it was personal, you know. They wanted a place for the kids and so forth. But I think that, um, when they decided that they wanted to be to, to to have a charter means to be recognized and so I think that's what they wanted they wanted the government to recognize their right uh, to be Muslims to practice Islam and so forth at the time that was low what was it was basically doing the little after the depression and things were hard here and especially uh, the black person was first was 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 second hired and first to be fired, and I did, didn't have no jobs or any type of things. And some people was looking for relief. Maybe this is good. Someone would come preaching Islam, and they said you ought to go listen what this fellow say. So they figured they're looking for something. And the idea coming on to onto this this may be better than what I already have. So people under that type of uh, pressure. Was, was, like I said again, looking for something, looking for something, a way out maybe. Maybe this is it, you know. Identity. Big part of it, I think, was identity because of the legacy of slavery and, and, and the devastation that it left on the African-American psyche, uh, you know, and uh, his uh, sense of self-worth was so damaged and not much was being done by the religious communities such as Christian yeah. Christianity and the different expressions of Christianity to really address that. Those people who have been down, downtrodden and the lowly in the society had always been the ones who followed the messengers because they could see the social justice, the economic equality, you know, and they could see the liberating force that uh, that divine teachings held, Islam in particular. But we're the only people on earth that you know that can tell you what it's like to have died and come back alive again. And that's the African-American experience. We were dead. We weren't brain dead, but we were dead. Uh, the, the whole kit and caboodle, everything, was geared to keep us in, in, in an unthinking disposition and an unthinking climate. I think for all African Americans of coming from underneath the bonds of slavery, both physical and mental, um, leaving behind you know the teachings of a slave master on a religious basis also, I think it's one of the things that attracted, I know it's one of the things that attracted myself to it. You know, it was different than what was traditionally taught in my home or my family. So, um, and then at that time myself, I was looking for deeper truth than I felt was being offered through Christianity. Black people are common folk, man. We, we, we want things that make sense. We want things that not only, makes, not only feel good, but are, is right intellectually. And what Christianity is all about feeling good. But once you come out of that moment where you see that the, your surroundings are still messed up, Everything around you still messed up, and there's like 20 churches in your community. You start scratching your head, like, is this the right way to go? 
And so you start searching outside. What's not really outside is, al is already inside, and that's Islam. I had had some very uh, fundamental questions about my Christian upbringing, and I was not um, completely satisfied with the answers that the leadership was giving me uh, around original sin, around the Trinity, and um, the acceptance of, of and tolerance of other religions. You know, um, the idea of slave, slave, being a slave, and when you realize that, you know, because for a while, me personally, that word is such has such a, um, a psychological pull when you say slavery, when you say slave, right? But when you realize that you're only a slave to Allah, to Allah, you know, that creates a whole other set of, you know, dynamics within you as a human being. And so for so long, we've been taught to be slaves of the society, right? Or slaves of our passion, or slave when we were, we were slaves, but then when you realize that I'm a slave only to Allah, to Allah. And that's the key for a lot of African Americans. Uh, to be part of a universal group that you can interact, move with, uh, regardless to where you're from. It's, it's very, it's empowering. It, it makes you feel good to, to know that no matter where I go, uh, I can say Salaam Alaikum, we can pray together, we can, so it's that universality. Uh, and it's, it's the embracing of, of humanity. And, and I'm kind of that kind of person who, who likes people, who looks for the good in people. And uh, to know that I'm a part of this universal family is, is just, Wonderful. Islam's reemergence in America was prefaced by years of confusion, where individuals and movements presented philosophies that mixed Islamic terminology, phrases, and practices with social messages of independence and occasional racial superiority. In this search for a true form of Islam, many groups and ideologies were accepted and rejected or transformed. The sections that follow will explore the indigenous Muslims' transformation from the Moor Science Temple, the Ahmadiyya movement, and the Nation of Islam. To Sunni Islam. The oppression of the African American people for 400 years, the condition in which they were brought in, and many of them, they came from West Africa. They were predominantly Muslim people. Many of them were actually learned people, very well learned people. They came in a condition that was inhumane, they were treated in a very oppressive way. They were forced to change their religion, their names, their culture, and the trauma that went into the African American people was so severe that with the first sign that took them back to their heritage, Islam, they were willing to accept it. We, when we track down um, you could call them sex or deviant sex, like the Nation of Islam or more science temple, in their lineage, we feel, goes back to Islam. So it kind of came back around in a way, you know what I mean, where you had people in the Nation of Islam later on go into Islam uh, and into true Islam, and you had the more science temple go through their phase, right? We feel that, that that's like a, a reciprocal phase that happened, and then it happened by accident. There was the more science temple who, who felt that uh, their answer was if you were a Moorish American, you would get a card and you would automatically uh, have a status that was recognized by the United States government. They felt that uh, the Moroccan government had made a treaty with the United States that any ex-slaves who became, who said they were Moorish American would get certain privileges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, basically, most of the Muslims who became Sunni Muslims, many of them came from the Moor side temple. Pittsburgh was a city of some importance uh, in the Moor side, and I think some of that importance was because at that time, Moor side temple was simply located on the east coast, and Pittsburgh is a city that is somewhat midway between the Atlantic Ocean in Chicago. Their, their, their group was that they had like bays and eels. The eels were the people like the government, what they professed, and uh, bays were the fighters. They were the 
the warriors. And at that time, there were the two two sides to the to the more science temple. You have a side of the more science temple that follows the reincarnated prophet, noble Jewali reincarnated. And you have a side that follows the founder, noble Jewali the founder. And they felt uh, believed in uh, that a spirit that all the prophets that that reincarnation they believed that in this that they just went through another that you take like Prophet Muhammad Allah forbid Allah style, that he his spirit lives on through the next and coming under their prophet what they felt was noble Drew Ali was a prophet and so the Moorside's temple so he would come to different places Pittsburgh, Chicago, Detroit, and they'd have large gatherings in their temple. And he came and taught them that one day all these riches and the houses, the new houses or whatever it may be here will belong to them one day. Noble Ju Ali was born around 1864-1865, uh, North Carolina. Uh, he was raised in North Carolina and he grew up there. And I was told that he traveled to the east. And when traveling to the east, um, he traveled. Why he traveled to the east, I'm not really sure. But when he returned, he returned with information that he was a prophet. And he had come back. Uh, he had traveled from the east to England. And when he traveled to England, he was supposed to have met with the Queen of England and demanded certain things from her for the African Americans of this land at that time who had come out of slavery. And then he traveled back to the States, uh, met with government officials, and he was told that, you know, they would not get in his way of him setting up his organization, but they told him that, you know, if he could get 10 members, they would be surprised. Mm -hmm. And he got more than 10 members, you know, um, from 1917 to about 1927, 1929, when there was some type of an occurrence that occurred uh, in Chicago. Um, it was said that Noble Jolly went behind the curtain and was behind the curtain for a while and then something miraculous happened and he reappeared as a, re a so-called reincarnated prophet. It seemed that their main em em emphasis was always on nationality. What is your nationality? And we are supposed to be Moroccans, you know, and that was the biggest part. More science taught nationality that amongst the human race you had different nations and that the African American race of people had been cut off from their nation. I mean, in the United States today, if you think about it, it is made up of a conglomerate of nations, Italian, European, um, China, Chinese, Indian, Southeast Asian, you name it, everyone claims a nationality. But the African American, what nationality does he claim when he's been cut off from the knowledge of his nation of people, you know, cut off from knowing whether he was a Mandingo or a Yoruba, uh, whether he was Hausa or a Fulani, you know, this has been he's been this knowledge has been cut off from him. And to reunite yourself back to the nation of families, you need to claim your nationality. Well, claim your nationality to me was to claim yourself as a Moorish American. In other words, the descendant of the Moors of Africa, born in America. I was aware even then that there was not a whole lot of focus on the religion of Islam. The way they pray was not in the, in the manner that Muslims pray. The Quran that they used was the Quran, and it wasn't the, the, uh, the Quran that Muslims are familiar with. They um, follow or have a book called the Quran. It's spelled with a K, K-O-R-A-N, which is equivalent to what the, we call the Quran, spelled with a Q, which is Q-U-R-A-N, um, as their principal teachings. So I really didn't find that it, 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 it addressed uh, the things that I really had a need for. Though I was familiar with many of them, I didn't see their lives changing very much at least around here. And I know that the Moore Science Temple have been here in Pittsburgh for quite, for quite a while. One of the early teachers at First Muslim 
was um, a Moorish American. And um, there is evidence of at least one of that I can name a uh, person who had been a Moor or they, you know, a Moorish American who became um, Sunni Muslim. And that was um, Brother um, Dean. Uh, had been associated with the Moorish Science Temple of America and actually, um, you know, moved from that into uh, eventually um, Sunni Islam. As far as Dawah goes and how members or people were brought, I believe it was the same as with Islam. People were just, you know, you start out with your family members and then your neighbors. You know, you told them, you know, you know they'd see you wearing your, your, your red fez and maybe you were asked about it. You told them who you were, you know, why you wore it, what it was about, if they were interested to find out more information. I remember they used to come with their dawah stating, yeah, man, you can even get high. They were saying, you know, because a lot of us during the nationalist days were getting high. And I, I realized at an early stage that that was one of the downfalls of anyone that was serious about nation building was the whole thing that everybody was getting high. And I had come to realize that uh, that's not going to get it because many poets have said when the revolution comes, you're going to be high. Then what you going to do? In the beginning, uh, the relationship uh, was one of people learning and teaching and sharing. And as what had happened with uh, the Ahmadiyyas later, as the community became more and more aware of the teachings, then they accepted some and they rejected others. And the teachings of the Moorish Science Temple uh, were, uh, were rejected eventually uh, for the, um, the more orthodox um, position. And the Moorish Science Temple was like a initial uh, beacon rod to call people to Islam, you know, um, even though uh, from my knowledge now there are many great differences between what I will call orthodox or as some people will call Sunni Islam and what more science temple practices. The words that were spoken by them, Allah, this is something new to most of the Americans. When you say Allah, they don't understand what you're saying. But it gave some significance to the word Allah when they came, because they used the word Allah. Islam, they'd hold up four fingers and, uh, and say Allah this and Allah that. Then I guess many people met other people like from Arab countries and so forth, and they became knowledgeable because they wanted to know more about this when you said Allah. More science didn't fill all the voids for them. I mean, there were, there were gaps that they saw and uh, Ahmadiyya, or Sunni Islam, or Orthodox Islam, as I like to call it, mainstream Islam, as I like to call it, filled those gaps and answered those questions it, it, on a firm base. Organization is a lot weaker now, a lot weaker uh, than it was. And it, was, it was, at that time, a very powerful organization in the Northeast. Um, it had ties to Marcus Garvey um, and his unified movement. Many of the members of the Moorish Science Temple, I believe, at that time were members of Marcus Garvey's movement. And um, I don't know if there was any communication between the two men, but there, were quite a few, there was quite a bit of membership crossing over. Uh, compared, to, compared to then, now and then, the organization, I think, in Pittsburgh is a lot weaker than it was then. At one time in Pittsburgh, it said that there was said to have been 800 members of the Moorish Science Temple of America. As Pittsburgh's indigenous Muslim community moved away from the teachings of the Moorish Science Temple, a man emerged who was responsible in part for that transformation, Dr. Yusuf Khan, an Indian representative of the Ahmadiyya movement. The Ahmadiyya movement exposed Pittsburgh's Muslims to a form of Islam more traditional in nature to that presented by Noble Drew Ali and the Moorish Science Temple. However, they differed from Sunni Muslims in their rejection of Prophet Muhammad as the final prophet of Islam. There were uh, some foreigners or immigrant Muslims who contributed to uh, the establishment of Islam by conducting classes and, um, and, and teaching the language and stuff. And Dr. Khan was really one of the most significant uh, people in that area. On Center Avenue there were so many people 
There was no holly room to stand under Yusuf Khan. And cars would be lined up and police would have to direct the traffic. And this came under Dr. Yusuf Khan. And people would walk from Yusuf Khan. They had walked from Homestead and to places all the way to Pittsburgh when Yusuf Khan was here just to see Yusuf Khan. They walked. There was no no buses. Uh, they didn't catch no bus. They walked and the crowd would walk back all the way back to uh, Braddock or Coriopolis. He, um, you know, uh, taught at classes and encouraged um, Muslims to, uh, to learn, even though he was, he was Ahmadiyya. And when he came, he got things moving. He was one of the people who brought through the grace of Allah many of the converts from the Moorish American. He came here and he went to their meetings and he watched and observed. And then many of the people he got in contact with, he was very fluent, he was a hafiz. And when, when the community then made that transition, um, then the, you know, the Ahmadiyya uh, theology was, was left behind. But what survived was actually his teaching of the language and helping uh, Muslims uh, establish the habit of regular study circles and, you know, and sharing information and, and how, you know, to, to get new Muslims uh, into um, uh, understanding the importance of Salat and, and so forth. So he was very, very instrumental in, uh, in helping establish um, that sort of um, routine or the, uh, uh, the prototype, how, you know, how do, how do Muslims study and what are we studying and what kinds of books. Even uh, Brother Mustafa, who was an Arab, told me that when it come time they would get together somewhere and they would have prayer together, they'd let him lead. Because they said all Arabs respected him in the Arabic language and reciting of the Quran itself. So he was highly respected as a uh, person. He could get people to do things or, in, or so. He just had gifts of relating to just about everybody. He was here um, prior to um, the 1960s. I did not personally know him. Um, there is uh, some talk now that he has uh, a daughter. I've heard that he has a daughter here in the city. And he trained different people. One of, one of his best students was one he's passed away damn named Elam Dean. He was American, but he was one of his top uh, uh, students. And what he did then, he would send them different places. He sent them to like Youngstown, Cleveland, Philadelphia, the ones that were learned that he felt that was, was able to teach and go there. And what they would do, they would go to that town and they would put like signs up and so forth and they'd give them a place that they'd pay for them to stay for so many days. Then they'd tell them the great Yusuf Khan is coming to bring the Risala that they'd never heard before. And the people would gather in these little towns and then, then uh, uh, Dr. Yusuf Khan would come and give like a lecture and so forth. That's how the first Muslim mosque started in Cleveland from, from, the, from uh, Dr. Khan. I'm not sure of, of exactly when he left. Um, I do have uh, some documentation that he passed, I think, um, in the 80s. Um, I actually wrote to the Ahmadiyyas and they, they gave me some information, but I'm not sure. I think that we kind of lost track when the, when the community made that transition. It was an introduction to a lot of people who would not otherwise have heard of uh, Islam or had found some organization to join. Those of us who know that history know that um, when many people were almost ignoring our presence, they extended a hand and, and helped us in those early years. Once you read something or studied it, you begin to, uh, like I say, investigate. And the more you investigate something, you can find, you know, uh, as, as, the old, as the Christians say, the truth will set you free. 
and as such it says to them, that, 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 that this is where the debate came in, that between them that they believed that uh, that uh, the teachings was the seal, but the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that he weren't the seal of the Prophet, but the seal was the knowledge of the Quran. So when you went to study more into the Arabic language, that's when I be really became aware of the significance of the word in the Arabic language that couldn't be broke, you couldn't cut it. It was, that's it. But many times through the English language, you can maneuver many things. It was the uh, first organized movement that attracted African Americans who were interested in the true Islam. Even though they later found out that there was some distortions and wrong in the Ahmadiyya movement. Because I remember talking to some of the elders at First Muslim Mosque who had come through that. They came from the Ahmadiyya movement to the Nation of Islam, to uh, Orthodox Islam, Sunni Islam. The Ahmadiyyas um, were very, very helpful in the early days with Islam, primarily because they were organized and because they reached out to the community. Uh, they had the, the Qurans and they had the, uh, the language and, and they were the ones who opened up to embrace uh, the community. Uh, but it was interesting that the, the education that they gave to the indigenous Muslims educated them enough to separate themselves from the Ahmadiyyas. And I think that that's ironic, but that is, that's the way the law would have it. So even though if you learn Arabic from, it doesn't matter if he's an Ahmadiyya or whatever, if you learn to read the Arabic, then alhamdulillah, so we were able, to, the community uh, learned uh, much of Islam uh, from the Ahmadiyyas and then consequently also rejected a lot of that uh, education from the Ahmadiyyas. As individuals such as Marcus Garvey began to set the stage for early black nationalism, many members of later movements such as the Black Panthers or even civil rights groups such as the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee search for a spiritual companion to their newfound political philosophies. A large percentage of black nationalists found their spiritual means in Islam, whether it was through Sunni Islam or the Nation of Islam. I would say a great percentage of the African American uh, people who accepted Islam either came uh, by way of the civil rights community or came by way of the things that were going on uh, in the civil rights community. The different solutions in our black nationalists were so varied that people were in conflict with one another about the very same thing that they all said they wanted to be about. That was the freedom and independence of Afro-American peoples. Whether it was uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for people such as uh, Jamil el -Amin, or just what was going on in the social environment at that time. There was the uh, cultural nationalists of Ron Karinga who felt that the solution was through culture, t t by taking in and imbibing the, the African culture. That would bring us freedom and liberation. Then there was the Black Panthers who had a political uh, agenda. They thought that uh, the, the only freedom and independence could come through the barrel of a gun because uh, politics you know, and, and power are synonymous. Then you had the integrationist movement. Then you had the uh, revolutionaries who just wanted to uh, bring about the downfall of the present order of things but had no solution to what they were going to replace it with. There was an option either you were going to accept Islam or you was going to be a black nationalist, but you were being called in your nature to, uh, you know, to address these things either way. Like I said, many of these nationalists accepted Islam. Uh, if they didn't 
except mainstream Islam, they either became Moorish Science Temple, Moorish Science, Moorish Americans, or uh, they joined the nation. There's two sides of that subject of Nation of Islam. I think, in general, the Nation of Islam was a great help to Islam in America. Uh, although that uh, Islam, as we know it, was not really taught to the new converts to Islam, to the African American people who really like to embrace Islam. But it paved the way in the, most, in the uh, African American community to get access to Islam and to get to understand Islam. <coughs> when I came to Islam, came to these teachings, uh, the leader was the late Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he's, after I came to be a member and processed myself a few years in, in what it was called the Nation of Islam in Detroit, Michigan, then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad sent me here to bring the teachings that I had heard in Detroit to bring it here. It wasn't easy now because they did everything that you could think of to, to cut us off. They feared us, some of them. The ones that had any kind of argument, they, they, they couldn't bring the argument because we were, the, ne the black folks been in destitution in America. You know, and our argument was, why would you go to Christian church and worship Jesus when, when all the worthies they show you in the Bible is white folk? And here's a white man, it, as soon as he get mad, the first thing you do is come up on your lawn and put a cross there and burn his religion right in your face. Every time we go and let them know that we were Muslim, they tell no, we can't rent it to you. They wouldn't rent nothing to us. So I started having meetings in my living room. So. There was too many people, so Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, well, you got to have a place now so you can take them out the living room and so you can grow. So we went to a place and he said, I tell you what you do. He said, stop telling the people that you are Muslims and when they ask you what religion that you, you are going to teach, you say, a religion of peace. That's all he said. He said, peace is Islam. You wouldn't be lying if you said, but they wouldn't know what you were talking about. So the first place we got, and I told him what I was going to set up a temple of peace. He said, okay. But when we had about two meetings, the word got out that we were Muslim. So the community came with petitions to petition us and put us out. So the man, he wouldn't, he said, no, I can't put him out. He said, those are good people. The hardest thing we had trouble with was money, but we were, we were vigilant. We'd go out, we'd put a roof on somebody's house, come back with maybe $1,200, $1,500, throw it on the table, say, let's get busy. Well, my brother worked at the vet's hospital. He come home, when he come home on payday, he just take his check and throw it out there. Say, come on, let's get, let's get busy. My first contact with Islam was um, the nation uh -huh. and Brother Fred. I always reflect and remember Brother Fred, uh, especially on a bus. I think I was on a streetcar or a bus one day, and Brother Fred was selling his papers, and we were sitting in the back of the streetcar or the bus, and I remember his, uh, his demeanor, his happiness, his love for Islam, and his willingness to want you to uh, find out more about uh, yourself. Then we go out in the street, we sell papers. We had our store running, wasn't making too much money off of it, but it was, it was moving, things were moving. It was creating a, a social order for us. We had a restaurant. and. It was nothing to give, every, give everything you got. They were pretty powerful all over. They were very prosperous. They had businesses, all kinds of um, they had schools. There was a lot of economic establishments. Um, and again, mostly in Homewood, restaurants, bakeries, uh, fish uh, stores, 
you know. I would have to say the city of Pittsburgh may have been one of the hardest working uh, temples within the whole community of the Nation of Islam. For me and for, you know, my community, the most visible Muslims that I, I seen were the Nation of Islam. Now there were a couple, there were one or two Moorish Americans, but they didn't make a very big impact uh, in my life. The ones we seen on the street were the brothers with the papers, and they were everywhere. The, the best thing that we taught our people was how to eat, how to eat to live, uh, take exercise, how to keep yourself clean, how to wear clean clothes, take a bath, wear a tie, no profane language, things like this. It's called the GCC, General Civilization. So you got to imagine these people coming up out the graveyard. They had to be not only resurrected, they had to be remade again. So these, these basic uh, tenets of Islam were civilization, how to civilize a human being. And then when they'd go out to get a job somewhere or go into a, 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 a business office to ask for a position or to get, they'd hire them because they were, they were intelligent. They did rational things and they were trustworthy. And then you seen black men in a, in a, in a way that you had never seen them uh, uh, but before they were clean, they were very respectful. You seen the kind of uh, respect that they had for the women, and uh, it really, it really had an impression on me. There were people who left the nation and who came to uh, First Muslim and brought with them certain skills that the community needed. They brought organization skills. They brought uh, how to get people. Um, to uh, openly communicate and uh, have more discipline. So there were things that they brought uh, besides the, the religion that was helpful to the community. Their development paralleled the Muslims. There was very little interaction uh, between the Nation of Islam and the, the uh, first Muslim mosque. Uh, but their growth, it was during the same time, same period. In addition to being a friend of Muhammad Ali and bringing the Nation of Islam to Pittsburgh, Mustafa Hussein was a close friend of Malcolm X and housed him shortly after his release from jail. Malcolm visited Pittsburgh weekly to write his column for the Pittsburgh Courier entitled, God's Angry Man. Before he sent me to Pittsburgh, we had, I had also got acquainted with the late Malcolm X. Malcolm was living, had live, he was living with me at the time. He used to live in my house. See, the imam here was the one that got him out the garbage can and brought him into Islam. So they was like rodents. When he came out of prison in 1952, he uh, was in problem with his people because he had become a Muslim and they didn't want him staying in their house. So they put him out, and he didn't have no place to stay. So he came to the masjid one night, and he made it known that he didn't have a place to stay. So I raised my hand when they asked if someone had a place, and I had just built a new house in Detroit. And I, I told him, yes, and there was nobody but me and my wife in the house, and I had two extra rooms. I said, I gave him a room. Because at that time, we would do anything for a person who called himself a Muslim, you know. So I took him in the house, and when I went back to the masjid the next week, they wanted to put me out. They said, but that Malcolm X, said, he, he's not a good man. We're trying to see what he's up to, you know. Say, he, 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 he's a bad man, you know. He's, See, he was a dope peddler, he, was a, he used to do uh, prostitution and all that kind of stuff. So, Dana Elijah Muhammad invited me up to his house again. So I told him, as he said, you got Malcolm X live, the Malcolm living in your house? I said, yeah. He said, well, there's not really nothing wrong with that. I said, all those things that they are talking about that. That's what he used to do, just like you. Say, you did, he used to do a lot of things too. Say, we hope that Malcolm quit all that stuff. 
when and now that he's a Muslim. Malcolm actually came here and helped establish the masjid here, uh, or, the, or the temple here. They don't call it masjid, but the temple here, um, which was uh, located in the Homewood uh, area of Pittsburgh. He used to come to our house and it, it bragged us about some of the stuff he did, you know. I kind of got attached to Malcolm. He had a tendency to experiment with stuff. He'll, he'll go just a little beyond what he's supposed to. He has street knowledge. And I didn't have street knowledge, although I was in the streets. He started to work with me among the people that I had been working with. Malcolm took Maceo and they went down to Washington, D.C. and he stood outside the Senate chamber until Adam Clayton Powell came out. Then he ran up to him and grabbed him by the head. He said, Mr. Powell, I presume, and looked out and laughed. And they took a picture and they put it in the paper. Malcolm and Mr. Powell become shaking hands, you know. See, prior, prior to Malcolm, the nation really wasn't uh, involved in the activities the social, political, and economic affairs of the community. It was Malcolm who started making them more broad. Prior to Malcolm, they weren't inclusive, only did things amongst themselves and really didn't um, stretch out into the broader community. It was Malcolm who made Islam more practical to the average individual in the streets. In the Korea, they used to have an article called Muhammad Speaks, Mr. Muhammad from Chicago. Elijah Muhammad was the, the writer. And on the other page, next to it, Malcolm X had an article called God's Angry Man. That was prior to the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. And the, uh, the believers at that time were required to sell the Pittsburgh Courier. Pittsburgh Courier was one of the biggest newspapers at the time. It was circulated nationally um, because it was the only black newspaper. One of the only black newspapers, I should say. The Courier did a good job until it got the law enforcement pressured them to do start messing with the, with the article, and he had to take it out. One day, we got a letter from Chicago that said, we're not handling their paper anymore. Malcolm himself almost single-handedly built the new paper. Muhammad Speaks newspaper. Him and Elijah Muhammad together, they devised a plan to start their own paper they call Muhammad Speak. We used to go, we used to carry newspapers and then every day we'd take, or take the money, whatever we got, and we'd take it downtown in the evening, send it Western Union straight to Chicago. After we became Sunni Muslims, just like me, when I went to Mecca and come back home, I saw what Malcolm saw. Now, now I'm a Sunni Muslim. I see, I see things from a different vision. We all come from one father and one mother, the law says, and um, which means no matter you know skin color, size, facial looks, whatever, we all come from the same gene pool. We got to drop that skin color. You got to drop that. The differences that you've been 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 wrestling with, you got to drop all of that and come together under one umbrella, and then you be able to to uh, cope with the situations that is coming up on the country now. Uh, different people get interested in Islam or become become interested in Islam for different motivations. Uh, but after they accept Islam, and after they gain knowledge, and they gain the real knowledge of what Islam is really all about, it is natural that they shift their position. They discover that to be a Muslim, you really have to learn your deen. And to learn your deen, you have to live your deen. So you keep evolving day by day as you learn your deen. It was, this wasn't an insane communist threat and all that bull crap. This was Islam in its, in its virgin growth. It was a baby being born in America. And we always said in, our, in the background, we whispered to each other, America's pregnant. She got a new birth coming out of her. And that was us. In the 70s and early 80s, Pittsburgh's Muslim community began to undergo changes. 
With the death of Elijah Muhammad and transformation of the Nation of Islam to a Sunni Muslim organization, the influx of Muslim students and immigrants from overseas, and the expansion of the Muslim community in general, additional mosques and institutions were formed to serve their needs. You know, it's very interesting uh, to have been in the city when in fact there was only one mosque. And as Allah would have it, it was called the first Muslim mosque, and that's exactly what, what it was. But um, the, the other communities uh, historically evolved uh, from their circumstances. In other cities, you had more than one traditional masjid. In Pittsburgh, there was only one. That was the first Muslim mosque until people left first Muslim mosques and branched out and opened up other mosques. And Mosque to the Movement was started by uh, Sister Ibrahim Dean and another brother, Muhammad Aziz. Muhammad Aziz was also um, a strong, had a very strong presence in the community. Uh, he was another person who felt um, that the law had put him here to protect and take care of people. He would visit the sick and take care of the elderly and, and pick up the children. He was really very much of a protector and a security uh, for the community. We've started Masjid Muhammad in, in, in the 80s. I'm not, what was it, 19, it was in the 80s. I can't really call it the exact year. It was uh, Muhammad Aziz and, uh, and uh, Sarah Jamila. Brother Mubarak uh, and myself. Master the Noor came about at a time when Imam Warath Dean Muhammad had taken the nation to the traditional Islam and the split occurred back in the 70s. A group of them uh, came together to, um, to, to worship uh, in a different place and they moved from uh, Masjid 22, Muhammad's Mosque 22, to um, go to, they actually went to other people's homes again. And uh, from there, um, I'm speaking now particularly of Masjid and Noor, went from uh, Masjid 22 to An Noor. When Elijah Muhammad died, Imam Warathin Muhammad took over the nation. And slowly, he started changing it through tradition to a traditional Islam. And it wasn't easy, you know, for the transition. Because a lot of guys, they, they couldn't handle it because they, then they left. I know when um, Imam De uh, Deputy Muhammad uh, took over office, he changed and he started teaching more toward the religion instead of the method that Elijah Muhammad had been teaching. And many, many people stopped following that, uh, uh, wouldn't follow him because of that. They didn't understand, you know. But I could understand it easy, you know, because I was with the honor Elijah Muhammad and some of the things he did tell me, you know. And, and I'm glad I was able to be closely associated with him because I probably would have been caught up in a lot of the same thing that the other people too were stuck caught up in. He tell you himself that he was prepared. They prepared him for his, him to take his office. And this didn't just start, uh, well, as this happened, started way back, even when he was a kid. They, was, they prepped him. Everyone was saying that, you know, well, Wallace is teaching Sunni Islam. You know, he's, he's, uh, he sold out, you know, to the Arab, you know. Well, I had been studying uh, Sunni Islam. I, I had been studying Quran. I had been studying uh, Hadith. And I didn't see Wallace that way. I seen him as staying within the disciplines of the Sunnah. But I didn't see him applying that sunnah in the same way as those who were prevalent in the society at that time. Uh, Sheikh Daoud, uh, Wali Akram, 
and some of the others who I know promoted and and uh, believed in the Sunnah of the Prophet. For the immigrant community, the first masjid was the first Dar es Salaam that was established, uh, I think, in 1981 uh, in Forbes Avenue, 3339 Forbes Avenue. The first Muslims who established Dar es Salaam, they used to pray in a hall uh, at William Pitt Union, University of Pittsburgh. And then they moved to Atwood the Street. They took one, uh, one uh, room apartment. And then the number increased, then they took two bedroom apartment. Then later on in the late 70s, in the 1970s, they started thinking of purchasing a place. I guess many of the students are, and, and people who were now official citizens in the United States living in Pittsburgh got together with some of the students of the MSA, former students of MSA, and established Dar es Salaam. First they established a meeting place where they had Juma at the University of Pittsburgh then they found a location. It was primarily uh, a place for students, but um, it, you know, it, it has uh, grown and now it has um, a more diverse uh, community there. This was the first uh, masjid in Auckland in the uh, university community, for the university community. But it was not really restricted to uh, the immigrant Muslim. It was actually uh, Muslims from all over the world, including uh, Muslims of Pittsburgh. So they wanted to make it of a universal aspect, have every nationality coming together. From the beginning, uh, Dar es Salaam included everyone. It was a very inclusive community. It was a wonderful. We were a smaller number. We loved each other a lot. We cared a lot. It was very much educational, social. Uh, we used to come and read and exchange ideas and share. That was a very important event that we used to do in that Friday evening, every Friday evening. We didn't have too much money at that time, and everyone worked with his hand. Cleaning, building, construction, plumbing, you name it, the mosque was done by the people. And this is actually was the best time in the Muslim community in Pittsburgh. They were very close. We felt that uh, the brothers did from Saudi Arabia, from different other places, so we should expand. Shouldn't be one little place sitting here with six or seven, eight people in it. You know, there's many Muslims coming from abroad, and you know, sort of large community of different people together. The brotherhood. The community was very small compared to what we have today in America. And everyone knew everyone else, and uh, the community were more integrated than today. That was something new to someone coming from a Muslim country, uh, to be able to meet with his, uh, uh, his peers and, uh, and discuss things, read the Quran, discuss issues in the Quran, and uh, read other books, uh, being acquainted with other schools of thought, meeting other people. This concept of the Muslim Ummah, uh, was a very theoretical concept when I was in Egypt. Uh, I, I knew that there is a Muslim Ummah, but I never lived this uh, concept in reality. Uh, I only met a Palestinian in Egypt, and that, that was the only non-Egyptian that I met during my life in Egypt. But when I came here the first week, I met a Jordanian, a Saudi Arabian, someone from Bahrain, from Qatar, from Tunisia, from Libya, from all over the world, like from Pakistan, from India. That was really great thing that I felt uh, I needed to know. I needed to feel it. I needed to live it. And it was a wonderful experience. When we moved to the old Dar es Salaam, that was a milestone. And then the next moment was when we moved to the new Dar es Salaam. This was also a good moment because the masjid was uh, very small for the community by that time. At that time, it, at that time, 1992, we were, in, we were looking for a place. Uh, we came in touch with the people at Jehovah Witness. It took about a year or two years of negotiations of, uh, because that building was owned by like three groups from the Jehovah Witness, and the offer was like 400,000, and then it reached about half a million. And uh, there were lots of discussions. They really were not 100% sure they wanted to sell, and we were not 100% sure we would be able to afford. We did not have that much money. It was very difficult for uh, members of Dar es Salaam. I remember two major fig figures, Abdul Min'im, uh, Dr. Abdul Min'im Al-Ganaini, and Brother Farooq Hussaini. 
they were both on the opposite ends. Abdel Minam was pushing hard for this building. Farouk Hosseini had a different view. I remember when we uh, bought the new Dar es Salaam, we, in Juma, you could hardly feel half of it. Um, one thing that if you pray in Dar es Salaam today, you go there, if you come late, you stand till the end of the khutbah. The Monroeville uh, Masjid, um, I think that it, it emerged as, as the immigrants were coming to the country. Um, you know, many of them, would, there was a time when uh, the government only let certain kinds of Muslims with certain skills come into the country. And there was a time when many um, Pakistanis and Indian Muslims were allowed in because they had certain degrees and skills that the government uh, wanted. And so you found that there were many doctors and many engineers and so forth. And, and as those people came, they gravitated to each other and then eventually they uh, formed the uh, Islamic Center in Monroeville. So they got together and, uh, you know, got um, their uh, money and bought this land and then, you know, built a small place and then it kept on uh, expanding as the need uh, increased. Initially, um, everybody did not agree that they really need a separate center here. So that was a, a struggle uh, to convince everybody that they should uh, establish a Islamic center here in this community. And then obviously next step is to get funds and, uh, and then, you know, to keep everybody on board and uh, so those were the initial struggles. Things uh, went uh, pretty well and then, you know, they kept on uh, increasing the size of the center and alhamdulillah, uh, now we have a very big social hall and uh, even a school uh, here. It was a very festive and brotherly atmosphere. At the same time, the organizational uh, structure of the Muslim in Pittsburgh had not evolved yet to start addressing the needs of Muslims in Pittsburgh and of the non-Muslims in the society and so forth even so much today. The community is really growing and is getting weaker. It's growing in number, growing in its financial ability and it's getting weaker. Islamically, they are, they are weaker. They are not identifying with the problems of the Muslim Ummah. They are not identifying with the Islamic problems that faces them today. They are not facing sincerely and openly the challenges that face them in America today. They pretend that they are making progress, but every one of them knows that we in America as Muslims, we are losing the grounds in, uh, in, on a daily basis. What has made me disappointed, let me ask that question, for, answer that question first, is the lack of organization of Muslims here in Pittsburgh to move out on the problems that we're supposed to move out on organization within ourselves and organization within the greater society of Pittsburgh. We are supposed to be the leaders in this society and this has been a disappointment. What could have happened did happen. What could have happened did happen and you could not have done it any other way given the knowledge that you have, given the disposition given your positioning historically, what could have happened did happen. So yes, many mistakes may have been made, but could it have done, could, it, could you have done it any other way? You know, I'm talking about as a Muslim community now, you know, so I, I believe that there's, uh, there's a solution in all of this, you know, that, uh, that will be made manifest. I think today most of the masjids are confused about their mission and their purpose, there is no sense of purpose. 
they are either reacting to something happen, something temporary, the action of the day, and they are reacting to it, or they are trying to gain acceptance. And you cannot really make progress, you cannot build a community while 99% of your effort is being accepted by other people, projecting an image of acceptance accepted to other people, or reacting to other events that you have no control over or you are not part of them anyway. And you have no real sense of purpose, your mission, your commitment, what's your priorities, that's absent. And the first, really, first step to uh, put the Muslim community in America on the right direction is that we go back and address these issues. Unfortunately, the majority of the Muslims, Islamic education is not a priority on their list. Their children's Islamic education is not a priority on the list. We need to um, uh, push for uh, uh, Arabic language and uh, Quranic studies. We really need an institution for this. And uh, we need to uh, pay more attention to the young. The American educational system will rob a child of his genius. We understand that more, I feel, than some of our brothers and sisters who come from overseas. I feel we should have been in the leadership role of developing Islamic schools. There is a strong sense among the Muslim community that they need really to go back to the basics of the deen, that the superficial mix of Western principles and Islamic principle, this artificial marriage that does not really work, and that Islam is the deen of Allah, and as such, if it's uh, polluted, contaminated, or diluted by other ideology, it loses its effectiveness. Uh, so that sense is very strong among young people, and that's a good part. That there was a generation that really have many illusions about their place in the Western society. And now um, the new generation are discovering that uh, going, going back to their roots is their strength. But the biggest disappointment I have today is the division in the Muslim community, one thing, that um, rise of nationalism is another thing, the cultural substitution of Islam, and uh, I hate to say that, but it's true, the weak leadership in the Muslim community, actually the absence of leadership in the Muslim community in every masjid. There is not a single masjid today in Pittsburgh in which there is effective or accepted uh, leadership. If we're to succeed as Muslims in America, what changes do you believe must be made? First of all, the realization that we're going to, going to die one time, one day, and we have a job to do as Muslims. I think that's the first thing that has to be uh, developed. We have to be taken from the level of being Muslim to Muslim or Muhmin believers. Because if, uh, if a person is a, a believer, he doesn't wait to be asked what he can do. He asked those in authority what I can do to help Islam. See, so we're a long way from that in the majority of these masjids. We, we have a core group of people that do that, but the majority of Muslims do not. That's the first thing. 
Number two, um, we need to develop more dialogue amongst the leadership of the various masjids so that we can come up with an agenda, a common agenda that we can work together on, if it's just one thing. Muslims in, in this country have realized that uh, uh, they have to be more active in politics and in different areas and uh, have to have realized to basically uh, know their rights better and uh, actively involved. And uh, if that happens, uh, overall outlook for Muslims in this country would uh, get uh, much better. Sometimes um, we, we get confused um, with what Muslims are supposed to be about and are really more about um, material things and, and those uh, external things. I think one of the things that we need to do as, as Muslims who are you know, committed to education from the cradle to the grave is to allow and encourage our children to, uh, to, to become, let me see, how do you say this? To become a part of the world without becoming in the world. You know, like, it's, it's good that our bright, uh, you know, academically prepared sisters and brothers are doctors and lawyers and engineers, and that's, that's great. We need all those things. But we also need writers, and we need actors, and we need recreation. And so if we're going to become a part, if, you know, then we have to have places where Muslims can go to interact, to do, and there should be Muslims in these positions. Lost is it's not wealth or anything that, that you know, uh, raises a person. It's righteousness, it's good character, uh, taqwa or piety, which is the, the love and the fear of Allah. This is what, you know, I think that we can get to these things as a, as a, uh, a group of people, then y yes, we will, see, we will see the same success as the Sahaba saw. We all have to stick the course and become strong in our beliefs until we have that strongness in our belief, our Iman. That's the only way we can be successful. وَإِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ سُوءًا فَلَا مَرَدَّ لَهُ وَمَا لَهُمْ مِنْ دُونِهِ مِنْ وَادٍ